I know that I've put this <laughs> this little graphic up here more than once. I would have preferred to use my iPad, but you know that's kind of like we'll get back to that someday. But uh, so I wanted to just kind of remind you. I know we've talked about these things a few different times, but just to kind, but just because we talked about it, just because we taught it, don't mean that it's really sunk down on the inside of our hearts. And so what we have here, this is just a graphic. It doesn't mean it's exactly like this, but. Just so that we're on the same page, we got the spirit, which is, that we're talking about the human being, right? And that he's tripartite, but right? he's three, he's three in one in the sense that he he is a spirit. So you are a spirit. And, and again, just real quick review that you're a spirit, God is a spirit, angels are spirits, demons are spirits. You are encased in a physical body, and God created you that way because. He created this physical realm in order for you as a physical creation to live upon this earth, but also to have authority and dominion. That was God's plan for Adam and Eve. Amen. And so, but you are a spirit. And so what that means is that you're never going to die. And it's important that human beings understand that, that you're never, we're never going to die. This isn't, you know, new age teaches you just become the spirit in the sky and no, you you know that's not true because see you're also a you you have a soul, and the soul again I've said this multiple times but the soul is what makes Ali Ali Vince Vince John John and Matt Matt and it's made up of a whole lot your whole life experiences, um, your memories your family uh, so many different things make up who you are. And basically, what I want you to know though is that you're an individual. Okay, you are an individual. So whenever you whenever you die, the spirit part of you is not going to die. I mean, yes, it caused caused the great white throne judgment, the second death. But that doesn't mean that it's soul sleep like some false doctrine teaches, like the Jehovah's Witness teach that you're going to soul sleep and that you don't. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches to be absent from the body is either to be present with the Lord or to be in torment. Right. And so. That soulish part of you is who you are. It's your identity, and it's what makes us as individuals. So it's important that not only you understand that you're gonna you're gonna live for an eternity, either because we are in Christ and we put our faith in Christ, we're gonna live an eternity with the Lord. But those that don't know Christ will live an eternity separated from the presence of God, and that and that's why it's so important that we allow the Lord to have His way in our heart, that we would be able to share the good news with other people, right? And so with that, but, but another thing that I wanted to say is because you have a soul and you're, you're going to know, you're going to remember, people will remember that you shared the gospel with them. I believe that with all of my heart. There's, you're still gonna, they're going to still have personalities. They're going to remember and it's going to be part of the torment. And I guess I would pay some of that off of the story that Jesus talked about in Luke 16, whenever the rich man was in uh, a torment and then Lazarus, not the one that Jesus rose from the dead, but another Lazarus who was a beggar. I don't believe that was just a parable because it hadn't been the case. I don't think Jesus would have gave him specific names like that. But, it, but nevertheless, Lazarus uh, was, the, was the poor beggar and, and, and the rich man could see Lazarus across the gulf and said, hey, Father Abraham, could you get him to just touch his finger and a little bit of water and, and, and you know, to touch it? To, to my mouth, and, and so you can see that there's conversation going on, and there's and there's awareness of, of what's going on in that situation. And so then, lastly, the body, and and so the body is. I put the word members here, and I also put the word flesh here. And the word flesh is not exactly yes. The word flesh can be used to describe physical flesh, and sometimes in the scripture it's talking about your physical body, but many times in the scripture it's got a spiritual component to it. And when we talk about the flesh, Flesh, there's an interconnection, and we've talked about that before, I believe, between the sinful nature and the flesh, because there's a craving towards fleshly appetites and fleshly lusts, and it's the fallen part of man, that sinful nature that we receive from our father Adam in our first birth that causes our causes us to have those fleshly lusts and fleshly desires. But let me just say this, and I want to get ahead of myself, without a body to interact. So a lot of these things are, are taking place 
in the mind, right? The, the desires of the flesh are actually taking place in the mind. Does that make sense? The warfare many times is in our mind before we actually go and touch something that's unclean. The enemy has already been tormenting our mind with it. If that, if, I know that that's got to make sense to you because, okay. And so a couple more things that I wanted to say is that when it comes to the body, I just wanted to say, I want you to remember because this would be the external world that we live in, right? And the world has fallen and we know that. But I wanted to just remind you of the close proximity of the body to the world that we engage, right? The physical realm that we engage, but it's in a fallen state. And, and so we engage this physical world with our physical body, if that makes sense. Obviously, that should make sense. But I do, but I do want you to also see the, uh, the, how, how the spirit, really and truly, the spirit and the soul, you can't really separate them. I mean, we're doing it for the purposes of teaching to try to have some better understanding of how the things that we engage in the, in the world and the temptations that we face and also the things that go on, on our in, in our internal man. But you really, for most for most purposes, you can't really separate the two of them because they really, the soul and the spirit are one unit that make up our inner man. But the reality of it is, is that the word of God says in, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, you could actually put that up real quick. Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, it says that the word of God is quick. That's King James. It's quick, which means alive. The word of God is quick is powerful and it's sharper than the two-edged sword that it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and so you can't really separate the two. I like the way that Brother Larson used to say it, that a the soul and the spirit make one unit, kind of like a wheel. You got a rim with a tire. If you take the rim away, all you have is a tire. If you take the tire away, all you have is a rim. So, But the two of them function together as a tire, if that makes sense. And so the soul and the spirit function together as your inner man, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, but, but the word of God will divide and it'll show you the difference between what's you and what's the Holy Spirit if you let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And that's much of the problem that we run into as believers is that sometimes we get confused between what's really the Holy Spirit speaking to us and what's really our own self speaking to us and what we want versus what God wants. Okay, as a matter of fact, that's a good time to do that when we talk about the soulish part of the man, it makes up the mind, the will, and the emotions, all right? And so the mind or the soul, the, the mind part of our soul is what we think. You, you know, there's a difference between what we think and what God thinks. Mm. Now, the plan of God is that the spirit of God will, will become so much part of our inner man that we will begin to think like God thinks. I got some scripture that we'll talk about that in a moment, but that that's God's plan, that we would think how he thinks, not what, not how we think, right? And then, and then we get into the will, okay? Our will versus God's will. Jesus dealt with this in Gethsemane. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, O Lord. And if we're honest with one another, many times we get in a struggle in our own lives where, but I will want to do this. I want this, yeah. right? And, there, and there's this struggle that takes place. And so if the mind is what I think, then the will is what I want, what I want, right? And then say, we know that God has wants for your life. God has wants for my life. He has a desire for your life and for my life and that we would walk in it. And then lastly, the emotions. And look, I would just like to say this, that, you know, whenever it comes to the emotions, if we yield to our own will and our own way of thinking because many times we're being tempted by evil to do that to begin with. And especially like whenever our will is outside of the will of God. When, the, when, the, when our will is outside of the will of God and we allow the temptation to pull us out from under God's will, then what we do is we're actually opening ourselves up. Well, we're walking in disobedience. We're walking in a spirit of rebellion. And I talked about that Sunday. But whenever we begin to walk in the spirit of rebellion, what will happen is, is that it will start to affect our emotions. It affects our emotions very negatively. 
Does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? Have you ever been an emotional basket case before? <laughs> or, you know, whether you're full of anger that you can't control, whether you're full of sadness that you can't. Now, listen, there's grieving is normal. Sometimes there's reasons that we grieve. Yes. And I mean, yes. look, I grieved. It's normal. Whenever my sister died, I mourned her very deeply. I grieved her very deeply. And, and you know, and that's a normal thing whenever we lose loved ones. That's normal human emotion. But sometimes it's because our own will, our own wants, our own thoughts drove us into a direction that we weren't supposed to be headed into. And then the next thing you know, everything's thrown off and our emotions are all out of whack and out of, and, and in the midst of turmoil. That's not God's will, right? All right. So can you put 1 Corinthians 6, 17? I want to just, uh, now that we established that, I want to just kind of give you, uh, and I've been using this scripture a lot. And, you know, the direct context is having to do with the Apostle Paul telling believers that they're not to connect themselves to a harlot. Okay, but this one verse right here says, but he that is joined into the Lord is one spirit. And so I want to make this point to you that if our spirit and the Holy Spirit are made one in Christ, then that means that salvation is perfected in our spirit with God. But let me just ask you this. Is it okay just to stay in this spot? To know, oh, but I'm perfect in my spirit. And a lot of people are talking about that right now. And I believe that. I believe that salvation, like, if my spirit's been made one with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's perfect. And so deep down in my spirit, in God's heart and in God's mind, I'm one with Him. And my, my salvation is perfected. It's complete. Amen. But is it okay to just stay in that spot? Uh, where we are one with Him only in the level of our spirit. Well, I can tell you that according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, it's not. Because God's plan is that he would sanctify us wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord wants not just your spirit to be saved, and I'm not saying your soul's not saved, but what I'm saying is he wants your soulish man to line up with the work and the new life that God has placed on the inside of your spirit. So new life in our spirit is the starting point of new life. I got this I feel like the Lord really spoke something to me earlier and I thought it was really good and I'm kind of excited to share it with you. But new life in our spirit is the starting point of new life. In other words, whenever you and I get saved in the Holy Spirit, we, we're told the gospel of Jesus Christ. We realize we need a savior, right? And we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sin. And when that really happened, we know it happened. Most of you can, can remember the day that you truly got saved, right? Because then, But let me tell you why. Maybe somebody never tried to explained it to you before, but the reason that you know when you got saved was because when you did get saved, there was a transaction that took place that changed things in the spirit realm for you, Amen. right? The transaction was that Jesus took your guilt upon him at the cross and that he that gave you his righteousness, the Holy Spirit gave you his righteousness, amen, through faith in what he had done for you at the cross. So there was an exchange that took place. And so now you being clothed with the, with the righteousness of Christ was the fulfillment of what the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't complete. And so now that Jesus did it, what happens is, is that the Holy Spirit moved in. That's Ephesians 1.13. You received the down payment of the Holy Spirit. And whenever that happened, there was a shift that took place on the inside of you. Amen. Somebody didn't even have to really teach you all of these things necessarily, uh, you already started to know some things that you were doing were wrong and you already started to know that some things that you needed to do were just going to be right. I don't know about you, but if you're truly saved, you know what I'm talking about. I can remember how many of those things started to happen in my life. So, so it, new life in the spirit is the starting point, right? Whenever we get saved and it's the place from where the Lord spreads his life throughout us. Deep down in our spirit, man, the Holy Spirit wants to begin to spread the life of Christ throughout our whole being. He wants our whole body, our whole body, our mind, and our, our soul and our spirit to be wholly sanctified. He permeates who we are. He changes.
changes who we are from the old creation in Adam into the new creation in Christ. However, what we need to re be reminded of is that our free will must be willing to work with him. Our free will in, obst in, in obstinance towards God, in rebellion towards God, if we're rebelling against the will of God, the work of God, the truth of God, then, then, then it, we're going to cause a stagnation to take place. We're going to cause a halt of growth to take place in our own life. It doesn't mean that God's going to give up on us easily, praise God. Uh, but what it does mean is that we, can, we have a part to play in this. Our free will is to yield to the will of God. All right. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27. And you can just put it in, keep it in the King James for now. And uh, the spirit of man is the candle. The ESV says the lamp of the Lord. The spirit of the man is the candle or ESV, the lamp of the Lord. Searching all the inward parts of the belly. And the ESV says the innermost part of the man. So the spirit of the Lord that is made one with our spirit is like a lamp or a, a, a light to our inner man. And the Lord and the spirit of God is searching and he's, and he's working on the interior of who we are. And he will reveal to us the things in our heart and in our lives that he is, is not pleased with, amen, and, and, and he gives us a plan where we can yield these things to him. It, it, it's not another program. It's not a counselor. It's not, it's, it's Jesus. It's, it's Jesus in the cross, amen, and those things in our life have to be put on the cross, Okay, whether it was alcohol, praise God, we're free from alcohol and drugs, amen. But, but guess what? What about those personality flaws, those those bad attitudes, right? And the Holy Spirit will search like a lamp on the inside of you, and he'll reveal that to you. And when you know the truth of the gospel, and you understand that Jesus already completed the work, now you yield, and you're like, Lord, I need you to put the cross on this. I need this part of me to die. This part of Matt needs to die. And, and what he'll do is, if you'll work with him, he'll kill it, amen. And he'll replace it with the fruit of the spirit. Yes. Praise God. All right. So look, a while back, this is the analogy that I felt like the Lord kind of gave me a little added flavor to this. So can you put Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23 up there? And look, I'll tell you, I think I was preaching on Naboth, Naboth's vineyard. And I don't know if you remember Naboth or not, but Naboth had a vineyard that was right next door, right close to Ahab's palace. Okay, and Ahab was the guy that was married to Jezebel, right? And and so Ahab wanted Naboth's inheritance, and, but Naboth knew something. See, and dude, that's so spiritual because the enemy wants your inheritance. You you gotta understand that Je Jezebel and Ahab were working in unity, spiritually speaking, trying to steal your eternal inheritance from you, and he ain't never gonna stop trying to do that. But let me not preach on Naboth right now. And Naboth said this. God forbid that I give you the inheritance of my fathers. And that should be our heart's cry, spiritually speaking. When we know what the enemy is up to, we should be like, God forbid that I go play around with some little playground of lust. Or I go play around with this little thing over here. Lord, I need you to do a work in me. I can't just sit here and live in complacency. And I can't. No, Lord, you got my heart. I want you to have my heart. And by the way, I want you to know that's really what I'm trying to talk to you about tonight. The heart. But I'm trying to prepare the way so we can get to the heart and the Lord wants us to be wholly connected yes. to him and yes. be like no you can't have my inheritance yes. no you lying Jezebel I rebuke you and bind you in the name of Jesus amen yes. all right so look what Le Leviticus 25 23 says though is this see Naboth would have known this scripture right look what it says the land shall not be sold Forever, The land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Now, is that not, see, if you you put your thinking cap on when you read the scripture, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'll get stuck and I'm like, well, what do you mean you're a stranger and a sojourner, Lord? I don't understand like this. You created the heaven and earth and all that in them is. I mean, but he's making, and you know, I remember when I was preaching this to y'all and the Lord revealed this to me. It's like, I wish, Brooklyn, would you do me a favor, sweetheart? Could you go in that office right there and try to find that globe, that globe and just bring it out here for me? I, I remember when the, when the Lord was showing me this particular passage of scripture and how God created 
the earth, amen, and he created Adam as a physical creation to rule and reign, and he gave Adam dominion and authority. Thank you, sweetie. You are just really a good student. <laughs> and he gave he gave Adam uh, dominion and authority to operate upon this earth. Okay, and but then Adam, in his failure, uh, he relinquished. We learned that from Luke chapter four, and I know I've talked to you about that quite a bit. Where in, Satan came to Jesus and he said, "Look at the kingdoms of the earth and the power thereof." Bow before me, I will give them to you because they've been delivered unto me, Satan said, and I give them to whom I will. And so what now we already should understand that the deliverance that was given to Satan didn't come from God. God didn't give it to him. No, but Adam created as a physical creation was supposed to be a co-regent with God upon the earth. And that that man was going to be a reflection of God's glory in heaven. But through the deception that the enemy gave to Adam, he was able to steal or usurp or to take away from Adam. The, now, praise God. We got it back in Christ, but I'm trying to make a point right now. Amen. We got back our power and our dominion and our authority through Jesus and what he did for us at, on the cross. Amen. And now you and I, as the people of God, we're not the same as the people of the world. And I want you to know that the God of glory lives on the inside of you and I. And whether or not we see things shift immediately when we pray, we should not be deterred. We should continue to believe God by faith that we will hold on because see, sometimes in the way room, he's working on you and he's working on me. Amen. And if he just gave us everything that we wanted immediately, we'd probably well, Lord help me, but we'd probably be like some spoiled brats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, what an amazing thing that this little piece of land, I, I, I think one day I'm going to probably try to circle it in, in, in red. This little thing right here, Israel, that little piece of property right there in, in, in a opposition to the rest of the land masses upon this whole earth. I felt like what the Lord was showing me, the land is mine and you don't sell it. Because you see, you're a sojourner and a stranger with me upon this property. And you know what the Lord showed me? He said, I'm taking it back, son. I'm taking it back one piece at a time. And the way that I'm doing it is, I'm looking for some people that will partner with me. I'm looking for some people because, you see, he gave the promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, will you trust me? Come out of your father's house, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to give you some property for that nation to flourish. But he said, look, he said, through your seed, and the apostle Paul tells us, uh, you know, what, 2,000 years later or so, that that seed wasn't plural seeds as the nation of Israel, but that seed is Christ. So the whole plan of God, when he took back this one little sliver of land and he promised Abraham, I'm going to produce a people out of you. And he did exactly what he said he was going to do. He produced a people out of Abraham. He made a nation out of them. But the whole point is not just for the nation of Israel. The whole point was that he would give the world the eternal lamb of God, the Messiah, the promised one who would die for the sins of the human race. Amen. Who would fulfill the sacrificial system that Israel was given as a type and shadow of the one that was to come. Amen. And so see, this, this may not really be as exciting to you as what it was to me, but I was thinking about the spirit. How whenever we got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in on the inside of us and how that's like the Israel of his starting point. You understand what I'm saying? Just like God gave, it gave Abraham the promise of the land and it came to pass. When you and I get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us. And that's like that first part that he's taken, but his plan is to, is to take it over. He's going to take this whole earth back. Yeah. And he's looking for people like you and I that are willing to work with him. Amen. And to live for something bigger than just ourselves. Amen. I hope you can believe me this morning tonight that that God has a plan and see in his character and his justice and his holiness and his rightness. God, I don't even know if that's a word, but, but God is right. You understand what I'm saying? He created this earth for the physical creation, but now the physical creation is more. He only had two choices. Now, some of this is kind of philosophical, but it's based on scripture. 
He had two choices. He could have wiped, wiped us all out. He could have just wiped the whole thing out and started over. He even told Moses that one time. I just wiped them all out and I'll start over with you. And, Mo, and I mean, look, he's probably testing Moses. But the point is, he said that. Even in the flood, he could have just wiped them all out. And he could have started over. But see, God has a plan. And his plan is to, is to work with man. I need you to get that tonight. I, we haven't even got to the heart yet. But I'm just saying, I need you to understand that his plan is to work with with and through man. He, he's not doing it outside of man. That's why your prayers matter. That's why your intercession matters. That's why you living for the Lord and yielding your will to his will matters. That's why, look, I just want to tell you that whenever you start praying, there's a, there's, there's a couple of different kinds of prayer. Like some of the prayers, we can be quiet because we're just kind of soaking in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes, though, we need to give voice to our mouth. Amen. Sometimes we need to declare, uh, amen, the, the goodness of God, the power of God, and we need to begin to speak it forth. Uh, the, the will of God based upon the word of God. I'm not talking about your selfish desires. I'm talking about the desires of the Holy One of Israel. Sometimes we need to speak and declare the will of God and let it flow into the I believe that changes things. You might think that I'm getting a little bit goofy with that but I'm telling you right now, I believe there's power in there. There is power in our words when we line our words up with the word of God. Now we're actually speaking the word of God. We are are his co-region upon the earth. We are a physical creation that he's given a body to. I, this is a little bit. This is a little bit premature, and I don't even know how far I'll get. But but look, if we're gonna, this is supposed to be an arm, by the way. Okay. So if, if this is your body and this is your flesh, and I don't really know that I have enough room up here, but we'll just say that this is a nose. Okay, and then this is a mouth. All right. This, I know it doesn't really look good, but uh, you get the point. And the, and the mouth has something to say. All I'm trying to get at is that you're a physical creation and you engage the physical world and the world's in a fallen state. And the members of your body can both reach out for wickedness and lust of the flesh or the, or the members of your body can be utilized as a vessel for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he can use you to proclaim his will in your atmosphere, at your workplace, in your home, amen. Man, in Walmart, in the park, wherever you are, the Lord can use you in the mission field, brother. Amen. And, and, and the Lord can use us, use our checkbook. He can use our mouth. He can use our prayer life. He can use our hands. He can use our feet. Praise God for people that have hands that can play musical instruments. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Look, thank God for musicians that can use their feet and their hands and play the, play the drums. Praise God. You get the point. Yes. So he's taking it back one sliver at a time. Mm. He created for himself a base of operations. Like, think about that. He created for himself. When he went in, he said, look, really the whole thing belongs to me. Is the point I'm trying to make to you. The whole thing belongs to me. And I can do whatever I want because I'm God. But he willingly limits himself to work with the human creation because that was his intent to begin with. And so he creates for himself a base of operations. And he, he goes in there and he's like, Abraham, if you'll follow me and if you will believe me, even though Abraham never saw the promise come to pass, Abraham believed him and God sure enough did what he promised Abraham. And he gave him that sliver of land right there and he gave him gave them a base of operations for Messiah to come into the earth. And listen, while you getting saved and the Holy Spirit come and live on the inside of you, he's, he's created a base of operations from which to work in you. Amen. And boy, I tell you, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing? I think we talked about that Sunday at each of us. John brought up Sunday about each of us almost like individual churches. And I used to say like an individual tabernacle, right? Where the Holy Spirit is in us but you, and, we're, and we're mobile, right? We're on the air. But just imagine if we yielded to the will of God. Yeah. And we let the Holy Spirit yeah. do his work in us. And then we came together as the body of Christ and we would really learn to walk in unity and in love with one another, there's just no telling what the Holy Spirit would do with through a people like that. Amen? And praise God. All right. So don't sell the land. It's mine and your strangers. Amen? And through the implantation of the Spirit in our spirit and these being fused into one, he's formed a base of operations where he will begin the plan of his entire takeover. I titled my message tonight, 
what did I title the movie? <laughs> At first I titled it, He Won't Relent Until He Has It All. But then I changed it. And I changed it, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Amen. And, and, and you can throw that subtopic, He Won't Relent Until He Has It All. Amen. Amen. He, he is going to continue to, to do what needs to be done in your heart and in your life because he wants all of you. Amen. Yes. All right. Uh, now, I do want to say this, that that according to 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it says this, that who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So in salvation. Not only is the Holy Spirit come to live on the inside of us, but according to the word of God, he says, you already got the mind of Christ. The problem is, is that most of the time we're not really operating in that mindset. Is that, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Right. OK, so part of the truth that our spirit is one with his spirit is the fact that we all have also been given the mind of Christ in this transaction because the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So look. I asked them to put the Amplified Bible. I think y'all did that the other day. Can you switch over to that? Because I wanted you to see something. And look, I study. I don't even know if, the, if you can really consider the Amplified Bible a true translation. It's more, I kind of look at it more like a commentary. But I felt like after all the translations I read that the Amplified Bible got this verse the best. Okay. So when we got saved, we also, not only did we receive the spirit of God, but we also received the mind of Christ. Now look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 with me. He says, I love the way he, this is worded. He says, yeah, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, if we can get it in the Amplified. Yeah, that looks like right, because it's got the brackets. So it says, but you have been anointed by. You hold a sacred appointment from. You have been given an unction from the Holy One, and you know the truth, or it could also be said, you know all things. See, when the Holy Spirit, that's the, that, that word an unction in the King James means anointing. The word is charisma, which is where we get the word anointing. It's like, it's like the oil of anointing. When you and I got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of us, the anointing, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit, is already on the inside. That's why when you truly got saved, you probably, most of you, automatically knew that it was a sin to keep fornicating. I don't know about you. Now, granted, part of it for me was my sister had been a Christian and she had kind of told me some of that. But the Holy Spirit immediately would begin to bring conviction into the heart and life of people. Amen. And he will begin to show us. And so that part to me is connected to the mind of Christ. That, that really and truly the mind of Christ has already been given to us. We have the mind of Christ, but we're not always yielding to it and we're not always operating in it. And in all of the things of our life, we haven't come to that place of maturity yet, if that makes sense. And so, but look at Ephesians 4.23. So this tells us, and you can go back to the, maybe the King James, that would be good. In Ephesians 4.23, it says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So just like 1 Thessalonians 5.23 tells us that, that God's plan is to sanctify us wholly, body, soul, and spirit, even though we have the mind of Christ, the scriptures tell us, matter of fact, uh, you can let me see here. Let's go. Let's go. Let's take a look at this a little closer in Ephesians right here. In Ephesians chapter, what is that? Chapter four, and then we'll go. Why don't you just start off a couple of uh, start off a couple of verses up up a little bit? Uh, let's see. Ephesians four verse twenty three. Okay. Okay. Let, let's go all the way up to verse seventeen. It says this. Ephesians four and seventeen. It says. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth, or from this day forward, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. So you understand Gentiles, most of us in this place know what that means. It means it's another way that that word could be used is heathen. It just meant people that did not know God, right? The Jews knew God, but the heathen did not know God. They worship pagan gods. All right. So he says, uh, walk not as the, as the, and so how do we, how do we equate that to today? How does, how does that work for you today? If you were going to try to say, well, how does that work today, preacher? Well, because it would be the world. The world doesn't have God. You and I have God. Amen. And so the world, if you will, is walking in the vanity of their mind. 
They have their understanding darkened and are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Who being past feeling have given themselves over. They don't even have a conscience anymore. They're giving them. And that's really what we're seeing in the midst of the world today. It's really gotten bad in case you didn't watch the news recently. They've given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But look at this. But you have not so learned Christ. Look at this. Conjunction. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth. Is in Jesus. See, if indeed you have been saved, if indeed you have been taught the truth of Christ and what Christ has done, then at some point in time, the way you were living in the past, you're not going to be living the way that you used to live. There's a change that's taking place on the inside of you. Amen. So he says this. He says that you put off concerning the former conversation that King James is old language. And what it means is that you put off the old lifestyle. The old man, which was born of Adam, right, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So one of the things before we transition real quick into the heart, I didn't really get through much of my notes, but I'm not going to keep you here all night. But one of the things that, that I want you to know is, is this, is that if he's taking this sliver of geography in our spirit, and he's wanting the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word and the truth of the Holy Spirit to begin to have his way to, in us at the soulish level where he begins to affect our mind, where he begins to affect our will, where he begins to affect our emotions, amen, and he begins to cause a transition to take place. And even though we got the mind of Christ, though, when we're not yielding to the truth of God's word, instead we're thinking according to what we want to think. And whenever we think that way, we're in opposition to God. And Paul's saying, but that's not who you are. You're not who you used to be. The new believer, the new creation in Christ, now he yields and his mind must be renewed. So listen, while you renew, part of the renewal of the mind process is the word, is the word of God. It, I mean, it's very connected to the word of God. It's not just, it's not just reading countless pages of the word of God. It's reading it and understanding it from what it's trying to tell you, what it's trying to tell me, and what it's trying to tell us is that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, that the old has passed away, amen, the old died with Christ, was buried with him, and that a new creation has been resurrected to newness of life. And so you are truly a new creation. Therefore, you, you do not think the way you used to think. You do not live the way you used to live. You do not do the things you used to do. And when you do, I heard one preacher, I think it was David Hernandez a while back. He said, he said, how did you say that? Oh man, I'll mess it up. He said something to the effect of your, your faith. He said, when you, if you're a Christian and you live and you're sinning, he said, you're not a fake Christian. He said, you're a fake sinner <laughs> because you're really a believer and the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. But you're over here living like you're a sinner when the reality of it is, is that you're not a sinner. And so you're not supposed to be living that way. You're just a fake sinner. You're a poser. OK. Uh, and you don't want to be a posing sinner. Right. You want to we want to be a, a real Christian. Amen. All right. So, look, we're about to transition into the heart a little bit. Give me Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, among, this is, he's, he's talking to the church of Ephesus again. Among whom also we all had our conversation or our lifestyle in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, what I wanted you to see there was how the close proximity of the flesh and the mind, right? It says it right there in the scripture. He says, in, in, in times past, our lifestyle, in, in the lust of our flesh, when we were living that way, we were fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I need you to know that these two are working bad and good. Right. Like they're working together. In other words, OK, I'm not trying to get too technical, but look, 
the, this is a good example of how the flesh and the mind are closely related. The flesh gives the mind a base of operations. In this case, the soulish man, his mind and his will, and the fleshly man, the carnal nature who says, I want what I want, are working together to entertain or give action to the desires of the sinful nature. Yes. But like what I'm trying to tell you is, is that if you didn't have a mind connected to your flesh, like a dog just operates an instinct, but you're operating at a higher level. Whenever you go and you do something that's not right, your, your, your mind is where the battle is taking place and you're not operating in the mind of Christ. You're not operating with a renewed mind. You're operating in the old way of thinking and you're giving liberty to your flesh to, to go out and to do things that are not godly. And so the battlefield is taking place many times. It start, It always starts in our mind. Okay. And, and it gets more technical than this, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. All right. Let's just transition real quick. And let's just talk about the heart just for a second. So the word heart in the, in the Greek is cardia. And look, I'm, right now I'm going to give you one of the pieces of, of a definition out of Strong's uh, Greek Dictionary. You, you do understand that when we look at Strong's Greek Dictionary, and I'm also going to give you some quotes out of Kenneth Weiss, who was also a Greek scholar, that what we're doing is we're, we're these, these men that are experts in other languages are giving us, through their years of study, their opinion on what these words mean based upon how it was used in the original Greek language and all of that. But the, the, this is not the word of God. This is, but this is their intelligent understanding of the original language. Does that make sense? Okay, so anyway, here's the definition that Strong's uses, or one of the pieces of the definition. The heart is of the soul so far as it is affected and stirred in a bad way or a good way. It's of the soul as the place of sensibilities, affections, emotions, desires, appetites, and Passions. So I wanted you to see there that the heart is connected to the soul. The heart is part of the soul, but more than just being the mind, the will, and the emotions, the heart has connected to it affections. The heart has connected to it passions and appetites, and it can be either for good or it could be for bad. All right? And so, so here's, a, here's what Kenneth Lee's the Greek scholar says in one spot, he says, the heart is the place of feeling, intelligence, and moral choice. So not only is it the mind, but it's also connected to the feelings. Okay? Uh, Ephesians 5.18, Kenneth Wee says this. Remember where it says, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened? He says this, the eyes of your heart. The heart referring not only to the emotional nature, but also to the reason and to the faculty of intelligence. I gave you a bunch of definitions to make this point. That the, that the heart is connected to the soul, and the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. But when you start talking about the heart in the scripture, it also has added to it desires, passions, emotions, feelings, right? And also like what your where your heart is, like where where is your heart? Does the Lord have your heart? And that's a good question for us all to ask ourselves. Does the Lord have my heart or does something else have my heart? And that's what I'm trying to get at. Who has your heart? What has your heart? Right. Because he, he wants the whole thing. Yeah. The, the Lord says, hey, I want the whole thing. Yeah. You know, Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my soul. And then the other song, and I will not relent. He will not relent until he has it all. Yeah. And so we find ourselves in tru trouble sometimes, some, sometimes because, because the Lord is gracious and he's merciful. And he allows these things to happen because he will not relent until he has it all. He, he wants it all. He wants all of you. Amen. Yes. Amen. All right. Uh, the, the ancient Kenneth Weiss again, the ancient Hebrews regarded the heart as the organ of the intellect and the mind and the desires and affections. So the heart is, is part of the soul, but it has added to it affections and desires. See, many people can even serve the Lord from their soul. 
Don't, don't, don't let me lose you. Yeah, we're almost done. The, many people can serve the Lord from their soul with their mind rather than what God seeks. Yep. See, Jesus told us when he was talking to the Samaritan woman, he said, the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth truth. See, the reality of it is, is that we can try to serve the Lord with our mind. What are you trying to talk about? Well, I know that the Lord's word says, forsake not the gathering of the bread, right? I know that the, that the word of God is important. And I know, I know that prayer is important. And so we can approach from our mind, like trying to serve God, almost like punching a clock, a God clock. Oh, let me punch in. Okay, and let me go through the routines of what I know, and that's works-based Christianity. Some scholars call it Galatianism. We're not going to get into that right now, but look, that's not, no. See, and let me just say this, too, about the, about the soul and the mind. God wants to use our mind. He doesn't want us to quit thinking. He just doesn't want our mind to be in control of his spirit. Oh, I just said a mouthful right there, my friend. God wants to use our mind, but he does not want our mind to control his spirit. I think I need to say that one more time. God wants to use our mind, but he does not want our mind to control his spirit and to suppress his will. He wants his Holy Spirit to speak to our spirit and for our spirit to be one with his spirit. And then now, hallelujah, speak to your soul. That's why when we come into the house of God, and that's why I, went, I didn't even really feel like I needed it, man. And I felt like I came in here tonight ready to worship. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Maybe I was hydrated. I don't know, but I felt good. <laughs> Praise God. And I felt like y'all were ready to worship the Lord. But I said, listen, shake off those heavy bands. Because sometimes we walk in the house of God, right? And we're just overwhelmed with heaviness. And, and we're like, man, I just feel so burdened and so heavy. Okay. Uh, but you know what? Listen, David said this. In one, of, in one of the passages, Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. See, your spirit, man, can speak to your soul. I'm just telling you right now. That's why I love that Brandon Lake song. I know I'm repetitive. I said it last week. But he said, don't, oh, my soul has it. Don't you grow shy on me. Yeah. Don't you? No, don't get shy now, soul. Amen. Oh, no, there's a lion inside of those walls. Jesus is worthy to be praised. No matter how bad my week went, no matter if I lost my job. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. It don't matter if me and the wife got in a fight or me and the husband got in a fight or I ain't got a husband, I ain't got a wife, and I've been looking for one and I need that. No, 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 no. God is still worthy to be praised. He's still worthy to be worshipped. And sometimes the spirit of heaviness trying to shut our mouth in the name of Jesus. Yeah. No, don't you get quiet on me. No, 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 no. The spirit of God on the inside of me is telling me Jesus is worthy. Right. Jesus is worthy. And I'm ready to exalt him because he's done it. He's done the work. He set me free. He set you free. Yes. And that's the problem. We need to let our mind yes. be connected to the truth of what the word of God says. You are free. Yes. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. It's done. It's done. Praise God. Singers, musicians, I didn't get through half the notes, but we're going to shut it down here. If y'all can come up and, and leave. But, you know, while they're coming up here, let me just say this. Colossians 3.16 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with grace in your hearts to the, to the Lord. Amen? Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You see what's happening here? Whenever we allow our, the Spirit of God that's changing our spirit to begin to use that as a base of operation, He just starts to take over the whole thing. To where our mind now no longer lives in the past. Our emotions are no longer... Problem, you know, being being tormented. 
but from the past and the decisions that we've made. Amen. But that instead he's he's taken over the mind and the will and the emotions. And now you can keep playing there, maybe whatever you really want. And, and he's taken over the will and the mind and the emotions. And then he's starting to correct things. Praise God. Look, I'm just gonna leave with this. Out of Matthew it says this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where is our treasure? And what, is Jesus our treasure? No, I mean, really, I mean, I know it's kind of like, man, if we really start digging down in that a little bit, we can get, it'll get kind of rough, right? Because, like, we're like, ugh. Like, I mean, no, really, what is it? What is your focal point? And I know a lot of you people are y'all in love with Jesus. I get I get it. But we all have been at times in our walk where Jesus was not the apple of our eye, where he was not. And look, Jesus said this, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. He said, he's telling us, keep your eye on me. Let your eye be singly focused on me. And if you'll keep your eye singly focused on me, I'm going to flood you with the light of God. I'm going to flood you with the light of the Spirit. Amen. Let's stand to our feet.